It's a question I imagine many of you are asking today, and it's why I've titled this video, What I Have. Ryzen 5 2600, or 1600 AF, versus the new Ryzen 3, uh, this is the right setup, Ryzen 3 3100. The former utilizes a 12 nanometer process with lower clocks and instructions per, while the latter packs a seven nanometer more efficient process. Which should you buy? Stay with me. By this point, you've probably seen our original ad for Thermal Grizzly's Carbonot Pads. They're clean, peace of mind replacements for traditional thermal paste, and best of all, you'll never have to replace them. But did you also know that you can buy Carbonot Pads in different sizes for various processors? 32 by 32 millimeter for Intel desktop CPUs, 38 by 38 for Intel HDT and Ryzen, 25 by 25 for the RTX 2080 GPU, and so on. They even make a giant 51 by 68 millimeter pad for Threadripper. I highly recommend Carbonot Pads, and you can learn more by clicking the link below. So let's jump right into it. Our test bench consists of an Asus Tough B450 Plus Gaming, 16 gigs of 3200 MHz DDR4 from Team Group Cash Latency 16, and an EVGA RTX 2060 KO. I have no doubt you'll see plenty of reviews today utilizing insanely overkill cards for the purpose of removing any GPU bottleneck. I understand the logic behind that, uh, but I wanted to offer a different perspective in this video. I imagine an RTX 2060 or 2060 Super for around 300 USD is something a Ryzen 3 or 5 buyer would be interested in for a graphics card, and that's why we've used this one here. Cooling our more balanced test rig is a Cooler Master Hyper 212 Black Edition running a stock fan curve. I'll be sprinkling temperature results into this mix, so so keep a lookout. Now our Ryzen 3 3100 sample ran surprisingly cool under an intense load, but struggled to overclock past 4.2 gigahertz across all four cores. That's something I thought was a bit strange. Many other reviewers I was messaging at the time were hitting around 4.4. I'm sure that's what you'll see in their reviews. Uh, so this might have something to do with the, the motherboard that I'm using, or possibly the kit of RAM uh, when running at higher frequencies, especially that can be uh, unstable for higher overclocked CPUs. Nevertheless, a 200 megahertz delta, I mean, that's not likely to change too much, maybe a few percentage points here and there. I mean, this could amount to, we're talking a couple FPS in most cases. And in retrospect, they wouldn't have changed my conclusions in this video, especially for the certain applications you might be buying this chip for. Now the Ryzen 5 2600 hit a comfortable four gigahertz. Again, that's a bit low for this SKU. I think I've hit 4.2 on a similar chip, uh, but using the same board and RAM should rule out any heavy disparities in our charts. Starting first with Cinebench R20, the Ryzen 3 3100 pulls out a respectable 2472 at a peak 61 degrees Celsius. This isn't an, a sustained load by any means, just wanted to show you what it looked like in a quick spurt. Uh, while the 2600 managed 3048, that's a 23% increase from an extra two cores and four threads. The, the thread bump overall though is 50% uh, over the 3100, so keep that in mind as you uh, chime through these graphs. And for those wondering, allowing the 3100 to run at stock with PBO enabled gave us a score of 2316, and one core boosted to I think 4.1 gigahertz. So the manual overclock to 4.2 for all cores, in my view, was worth it. Uh, you know, I'm sure we could have gotten, again, a much higher overclock, possibly with a different platform uh, on this chip. I don't think I was sent a dud. It's a reviewer sample. I didn't even get a box for it. So uh, I think 4.4 is safe to assume for these, which is pretty good in a $99 chip. Geekbench 4 with a similar story though, multi-threaded applications and benchmarks like these tend to favor higher core count variants in CPU families, and the 2600 took the cake with 23,367 versus 20,100. Single core results, however, shed light on the efficiency of the 3100's newer seven nanometer process, 5470 versus 4767. And it's these deltas between single and multi-core scores that essentially write the script for the remainder of this video. So uh, you'll, you'll definitely see this narrative play out throughout our test. As I'm sure you can imagine, games that effectively utilize six or more cores will generally perform better uh, with the 2600. Now, older, less parallelized titles that prefer stronger individual cores might give the 3100 an edge. At least that's what we should expect based on what we've seen just from Cinebench and Geekbench. Does it play out though? 3D Mark Time Spy optimized for a multitude of threads and the 2600 handily takes the cake. It isn't much of a surprise again, and, and do note the reduced variance between the overall scores where leverage from our graphics card closes the gap substantially. You notice this when you 
pair a CPU of this caliber with a graphics card that's not $1,000 or more. Ashes of a Singularity CPU-focused built-in benchmark in DX12 yielded interesting results. In 1080p standard preset, the 3100 managed 34.5 FPS on average, with 1% lows dipping to 24.1, but the 2600 only slightly managed a victory, with an average 35.6 FPS and 1% lows matching almost verbatim. GTA 5 is next, sticking with the 1080p resolution, high settings, no AA, and no advanced graphics. The 3100 pulled off an impressive 129 FPS on average. This isn't a $99 chip, uh, in tandem with our 26 60KO, mind you, uh, while the 2600 squeaked out, uh, wait, hold on, what's this? A small loss on average for the six core counterpart, and significantly lower 1% averages. So who would have thought of that? But okay, Greg, GTA 5, I'm gonna several years old, and that, that, that thing came out at the same time my channel was born. So let's try something a bit newer. How about Assassin's Creed Odyssey? Well, ACO is certainly more CPU bound in this scenario. In our side-by-side -side comparison, thread utilization consistently pegs 100%, which places a heavier strain on the four core chip. But in spite of this, the 3100 and 2600 remained extremely competitive, 74 versus 75 FPS on average, and identical 1% lows. This isn't what I expected, to be frank. The 3100's holding its own in games. But remember, we're pairing both of these CPUs with a mid-range graphics card, one I presume many of you, again, will consider in a comparable budget. And it's certainly keeping things a lot closer than they would be if we were using a 2080 Ti. Up next, Shadow of the Tomb Raider. And it's a similar story. Despite an inherent advantage with the DX12 API, the 3100 actually narrowly wins this round. 109 versus 104 FPS and 74 versus 72. These are differences I don't expect the human eye to discern much, again. But up to this point, did we really expect a four core example to keep up with its beefier older brother that, uh, isn't much worse from a single core performance perspective. Now, let's place gaming aside for a second. Without a doubt, the 3100's eight strong threads are pulling their weight, but we haven't talked about another practical application for these CPUs, and that's content creation. I still use Adobe Premiere to this day, despite its many frustrating attributes, right, Nate? Yes, sir. Uh, and it's here where we should expect raw core count to supersede small differences in clock speed and efficiency. The Ryzen 5 2600 renders a 10 minute 4K video file in approximately 905 seconds, whereas the Ryzen 3 3100 manages the same file export in 1,055 seconds. Now, to be completely frank, I expected a sharper difference between the two, so I'd say this is actually a somewhat of a win, at least for the 3100, especially given the 50% increase again in pipelines for the 2600. 3100, it's holding its own. But let's jump back to gaming once again. We've tested a few older titles and a few newer titles, and the results were a bit washed. Neither chip really stood out, which I suppose is great news for the 3100 because it's the newer chip. But what about streaming? If I were to simulate a streaming scenario with, say, GTA 5, how different would things look on the streamer side? We set up a scenario in OBS using a video bitrate of 4 megabit per second, the faster X264 preset, and a simultaneous MP4 background recorder. And finally, we see a noteworthy difference between the two. So while the 2600 is technically on an inferior, less efficient process, that 50% pipeline bump works wonders, keeping frame rates well above 100 FPS on average. On the other hand, the 3100 noticeably falls short on both averages and 1% lows, nearly 10 frames per second apiece. This, I mean, come on. I mean, this is a game that the 3100 initially performed better in, so I was trying to give the 3100 any edge that I could, but if you're gonna stream daily, I recommend at least a six core CPU. Heck, a lot of games can fully utilize at this point six cores, and that's something we couldn't say about four or five years ago. So uh, the, the case for the four core chip, despite this being a really good value proposition, falls short in the streaming department. A lot of people are streaming, so Again, kind of a kind of a wash. And I mean, I get it. This is a brand new $99 chip. Heck, the 7700K, or I guess I should say that the non-K SKU would be closer to this one in terms of performance, was $300 or thereabouts when it came out. We're getting essentially the same performance for one third of that price a few years later from the competitor, from the competing company. That's impressive. But at this point, they are essentially competing with themselves in this space, at least until the Intel i3 with hyper-threading launches, which could totally change the, the ending of this 
video. Uh, but until then, because I don't have those results and I can't, even if I did, I couldn't disclose them, I can't conclusively say this is the chip to buy. I mean, same goes for the 1600 AF, for the 2600. Those two chips versus the i3 10100, whatever it's gonna be, 10300, I just, we're unsure at this point if they're gonna be viable, because traditionally i3s have not been the best for gaming. But if I had to choose between one of these two chips for everyday use, personally, it'd still be the 1600 AF. It's using Zen Plus architecture, so it's more voltage tolerant and friendlier with the uh, wider variety of kits of RAM available. It's still a killer deal. It crushes games and its price point, and it's objectively the better streaming CPU thanks to its additional cores and threads, assuming you can get a, a, a mild overclock at least. But either way you go, you'll be sitting on a great platform with user-friendly and budget-friendly chipsets like B350, 450, and soon to be 550, though if the only advantage and 550 is PCIe 4, I recommend you stick with 450 uh, if you're gonna buy a chip like this. It just doesn't make sense to pair a sub $100 CPU with a drive that's gonna at least cost you 200 bucks. That's just me. Spend your money how you want, but hopefully this video has cleared up concerns you've had regarding the 1600 AF's viability and appeal in light of AMD's most recent CPU launches. By the way, I was also sent the 3300X, uh, but apart from clock speed, which you can still hit, on a 3100 if you do a bit of tinkering, I, I don't really see the budget appeal. I'll stick to the 3100 if you want Zen 2, or stick to the 2600 or 1600 AF if you want better multitasking support. Either way, you won't be disappointed, and I, I frankly don't think you'll notice in most applications. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. I appreciate that. Consider subscribing, and I'll catch you in the next one. My name's Greg. Thanks for learning with me. Oh, and affiliate links. If you want to buy this or a chip like it, check them out.